Hello pianist, you just heard Just Strutting Along. This is by Martha Muir. It comes from her top selling book, Jazz, Rags and Blues, 10 original pieces for the late elementary to early intermediate pianist, book one. This is the first of a five book series. It's great for you to check out if you love this style of music. It can also be learned in Alfred's group piano for adults, book one on pages 344 to 345. It's a terrific jazzy piece appropriate for later beginner pianists. Actually, I teach this piece within my second semester class piano course at the university where I instruct. I love to play jazz music myself and as a piano instructor I have all of my students play some jazz rags and blues as well because it helps develop so many terrific piano skills which you can transfer to all styles of piano playing. So some of those skills are jazz is so unique for its sense of rhythm. It has those swung eighth notes, I'll teach you how to count today. It has syncopations, which is so different than the classical era where we emphasize those weak beats. And it requires some occasional counting for some of those challenging passages between the hands, which is great for hand independence development. The harmonies and melodies are so colorful and enticing. It teaches the pianist to read with accidentals along with key signatures with all that chromaticism so it develops that automatic note reading, intervallic reading will do today as well. Makes you also understand theory and harmony with all the extended chords that we have in jazz music. Jazz music is also full of an array of colorful articulations, accents on those weak beats, staccatos like a string bass is being plucked, you have phrase shaping and phrase goals, so many little nuances that will add into classical music as well. Lastly, jazz music is uniquely marked by its sense of improvisation. Even a piece that's written for piano, I'm gonna add some improvisation to this as well, give you some ideas for rhythmic improv, some little grace notes you can add, some octaves that you can add. So if you were playing in a jazz ensemble, you might be asked to solo on the keyboard if you're playing on the saxophone. So these improvisation ideas really just mark it as unique from the classical era. These terrific piano skills learned in a jazz piece like this and others which I'll coach you in the future can then be transferred to classical music, makes you play with more precision and expression. All right, pianists, let's learn this piece together in an organized approach using the Bronson Musical Learning Pyramid. We're gonna start with the bottom element, which is the most important to any piece of music, especially jazz, which is rhythm. So one of the essential elements that just makes this uniquely sound jazzy is its rhythm. So we'll talk about the swung eighth notes today and those syncopations. So let me explain syncopations before I teach you how to count them. Syncopations is emphasizing the weak beat. So you think in a 4-4 time signature, think like back to the Mozart, we're in a 4-4, a regular classical metric would be emphasizing beats one and three. So think one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. So the music naturally falls into that pulsing of one and three, makes it feel very regular. Jazz music kind of reacts against that. It's a different culture that we're representing. So this emphasizes the weak beat. So if you look at like major three, I have an accent on the and beat of four. So two and four are weak beats, but then even the subdivision, those and beats are even weaker. So here's major three, a one and two. So another example of syncopation is the melody at major nine, where we have the accent on the and of one, one and two. So there's an explanation of syncopations. Let's go into how you can practice tapping and counting this along. So you can use my performance model. Once I've taught you how to count it, go back and practice tapping even both hands together or one hand at a time. So the swung eighth notes at the top of the music, you can see it has two eighth notes equals a quarter note and an eighth note within a triplet. So you can use your triplet counting of one and a two and a three and a four and a to actually be very precise on the way you count this. So I'm gonna count this out in major one, see if you can tap along with me. One and a two and a three and a four and a one and a two and a three and a four and a one and a two and a three and a four and a one and a two. So you might have noticed that the second eighth note is going to fall on the last triplet of the major, which I've tried to show you there on the screen with that three and a, uh, that's gonna fall there. If it's too much to count it out loud, which is a great skill for developing your keyboard skills, you can always set it to a metronome. As fast as my metronome goes, it's 218. So I'm gonna turn it on. This is the triplet eighth note you're gonna hear. Pretty fast. Think one and a, two and a, three and a, four and a. So 
but metronome requires you listen very carefully. So if you can't really count along at the same time, metronome is a nice guide. You can even practice counting along with that metronome. Just develop that sense of swung eighth notes. You can also just think long, short, long, short, long, short, long, short, long, short. So the first eighth note is emphasized, it's longer. The second eighth note is shorter and even a little bit quieter at times. One more rhythm I want to point out would be measure eight. Notice that the rest is a quarter rest. Before that, it's been a series of eighth rests. So I hear students sometimes treat that as an eighth rest, but here's measure seven. One, two, three, four. So careful that those rests are changing off there. Just a little spot to isolate as you learn this piece. Overall, we suggest perhaps a performance uh, speed of 108 to 120, moving from moderato just to the early part of that allegro. All right, next pianist, let's move into the note reading and fingering category of our musical learning pyramid. So I first look at my key signature. I see zero sharps or flats. So that could be a couple options. Could be C major. It doesn't really sound like the key that I was playing in. This is using the relative minor. So take your tonic of C, go down three half steps. One, two, three. This is in the relative minor of A minor. This is an excellent piece to practice your three forms of minor, which I've taught you in some other videos. So if I look at measures one through three, I see zero sharps or flats, so it's natural minor. It's natural to the key signature. Here's where you can practice some of your theory and your scales along with that rhythm. I love to combine skills. We're gonna play one octave swung eighth notes, natural minor for A. Here it is, one and two. at measure four, notice I have an F sharp and G sharp, which is the sixth and the seventh scale degree in the key of A minor. It's been raised, so this is melodic minor as it ascends. Notice the next two measures, it flats those two scale degrees as it comes back down. Let's play that scale now. Here's melodic minor. One, two, three, four. All right, there's one last form of minor, you might have guessed it is harmonic minor. Let's look at the harmony at measure eight. That is an E7 which is the dominant of our key, our 5-7. So I only have the G sharp, sharp, the seventh scale degree. That is harmonic minor. It'd be a great way just to warm up on this piece to get you thinking in your keys and practice those swung eighth notes as well. All right, let's next move to getting these notes played on the piano. This is an excellent piece for reading by octaves and the hands having to shift very quickly, a good keyboard skill to learn. Let's look at the right hand. I'm gonna play the note first and I'll explain how I know it's there. I look at the octave sign below the notes. You have to watch the octave placement. If it's below the notes, it means your hands go down an octave. If the octave sign was flipped above the notes, then I move up an octave, so watch that placement. So the right hand actually starts below middle C on an A3, the left hand is on an a2, notice your fingerings. I'm set within like an E five finger scale position. We're just gonna practice playing the A's of each measure to get our octaves correct. Next measure two, the octave sign is gone. So I'm gonna move up to A3 and A4. Measure three, back like the first measure, back down. And then I stay there. There's a hand position shift into measure five where the thumb goes on an A3. And then you stay there for a while. Measure 11 is sometimes a mistake. Students will try to jump their hand all the way up to measure 11. Notice the octave lower sign at measure 11. So that G to A is in fact just a whole step or a major second apart because it's on A3. Let me show that again. Measure 10, right there to play. The melody repeats at 13 up to an A4. right hand down to A3, 22, both hands move up an octave, octave down, here we catch the pedal and the left hand comes up, notice the stem direction down on the D sharp, so the left hand takes the D sharp, the right hand takes the perfect fourth above it with an A5, so even just practicing the right hand by itself, playing the first note of each measure, just to get your octaves correct before you try to play that hands together is a good practice skill. 
Lastly, with the note reading, we always think about what kind of patterns do I use? Do I have scales? Do I have chord outlines? So I look at the left hand. It's a very scalar type of melody, especially at major five goes down by steps. It doesn't move very much at all except for like major two and then towards the end. The right hand is much more diverse as you saw in those octaves it uses and intervals. So this is a great piece to develop your interval reading skill. So I would encourage you to even take it hand separate and just even think in your mind or say out loud your intervals. So you have a same, second, third, Major two is the exact same pattern. Look ahead. Second, third, fifth, second. Here's major, five, third, second. Great for half step and whole step movement. Steps, third. You could even go through and circle those thirds. Measure eight uses that fourth. It's actually a tritone, an augmented fourth. We'll talk about phrase goals with that in a little bit. But you can go on through, pause it there, and practice hands separate. Thank your intervals. You can tap your foot along. So a good hands together skill. You could play the right hand and just practice tapping the left hand along with it. It could be on your lap or even up here. I'll just demonstrate a little bit of that skill of playing the right hand and tapping the left hand. Here's a major five. A one, two, three, four, left. <laughs> For feeling that pulse. You notice the left hand's kind of that regular classical rhythm on one and three, and the right hand syncopates off it like an ensemble would have between two instruments. Next piano, let's move up into the articulation category of our musical learning pyramid. The articulations are really unique and give it a very jazzy sound as well because it emphasizes those weak beats with accents. So we're going to bring in some technique to get these articulations precise. So on your staccatos, think a quick up motion, maybe like a string bass was plucking the strings on that. Imagine the keys are hot. So you're going to think up. Up, and that up motion can propel you down for the accents. Like if you were, if you play the clarinet or saxophone, there's more of a burst of air, so there's heavier arm weight. So think up, up, down, up, 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 down, up, 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 down, down. So that arm weight needs to engage down to get those accents. Let me show you again at three. Up, up, short, short, rest. I'm going to pause there, then we're going to go through a little bit of technique for the right hand. In measure five, we're going to practice just the right hand alone, so you can watch my hands very carefully. With all of these slurs, it requires some wrist scooping under. Remember, as I go higher with the right hand, I'm going to scoop under. You can check out a separate video for wrist circles. I'll just review a little bit here. As I go towards my body or to the left or down, I'm going to scoop over. So here's measure five. Three, four, one. Under. Over. Under. Quick down, over, down, over, up, up, down, two, three, four. So on, that's pretty much the general format of it since it repeats itself back at measure 13. Lastly, with articulations, there's just a few little spots where it's unmarked where you get to decide as the pianist what you'd like to do. The left hand specifically at measure five through the downbeat of eight has nothing marked. You could play it slurred and smooth. Or you could detach it. My suggestion would be to try both at different spots of this piece. Maybe it starts really smooth and connected. Maybe we detach it. Makes it feel more charged that way. So you can decide what you like and write that in your score. All right, pianists, we're working our way to the top of the musical learning pyramid. We've arrived at dynamics. We need to decide on voicing and phrase shaping. If we follow those articulations well, like we did in the previous category, we've already given some phrase goals actually to this piece. So if we think about voicing, think about an ensemble. Who do you want to hear louder? Do you want to hear those higher parts, the saxophones, the trumpets? Do you want to hear the lower part, the trombones and the string bass? You can really decide in the intro. It could be the right hand. It could be the left hand. off to the right hand. It's really up to you to decide. I don't think you could really go wrong in the intro. Notice that material repeats kind of in the middle and then at the end so you could vary it as you go through. But once the melody starts at measure five, it definitely is a higher instrument. It should be representing someone kind of soloing in the ensemble. Along with this, I want you to be creative. I want you to think, all right, in my jazz ensemble, I have instruments like the saxophone, the trumpet, sometimes even the clarinets, string bass, the piano as well. Who's soloing here? At major five, it feels more kind of chilled. I'm gonna decide on the saxophone for this right hand. 
How about it major nine with those accents? We could go maybe more of a trumpet. So on. And then when it goes even higher, maybe it could be the full trumpets along with the saxophones so you can layer those different instruments. So you be creative and decide and even write in your score which instruments the melody is representing. Next pianist, let's go into the phrase goals just to give the melody some more nuances. Let me explain what these arrows mean in my score. The arrows are meant to give you a guide of where to play the loudest, the richest point of your phrase. It will vary if it's mezzo forte or forte based on the context, but it's the loudest point of that phrase. So what that means is I crescendo up to it and I decrescendo away from it. So major three, I have two accents. So I'm gonna play the second accent the loudest because it's the most syncopated one. A one, two, three, four. Measure five, the arrow is where I'm going to crescendo to. Come away, sneak in, go. Crescendo, come away. Go for it, here it is. Day crescendo. Drive. And then at 13, we'll talk about that in a little bit as we add some improv as well. So let me just give you a little background of why we put phrase goals at specific spots. If I have a longer phrase, I don't want to typically accent the beginning and the end because it doesn't leave me much room to do anything else unless the composer specifically says it, like measure nine and 10, I would accent the beginning of the phrase. Otherwise, it's typically the most dissonant notes in the middle of the phrase. They're often the higher Notes within the right hand or the lower notes of the left hand make great phrase goals. And that's pretty true for classical music as well. The dissonances, higher, lower notes in the middle of a phrase are great phrase goals. Okay, pianist, last in the dynamic category, which really moves us into the style and mood of this piece. We're gonna talk about some improvisation. I'm a classically trained pianist, so I'm gonna be brave, I'm gonna be vulnerable and play some improv for you. But we're in the style of jazz music where this is how they vary repetitions of music. You get kind of a general melodic idea, and it never comes back exactly the same. So I would suggest perhaps at measure 13 or even back at 17, we would add a little bit of a contrast within this melody. So there's lots of ways that this can be approached. I'm gonna give you just a couple. I want you to experiment on your own. You'll come up with probably even better ideas that I can show you today. So at 13, we're gonna work with the left hand. We're gonna add a little syncopation in the left hand. A one, two, and three. That's just a simple little improv. The right hand, I'm gonna add a couple of grace notes. So we've worked our way up with that improv to the style and mood, which is a free, spontaneous, relaxed feeling for this style of jazz music, because jazz can be kind of a whole spectrum of moods and emotions. So enjoy learning this piece to build your piano skills. It's really gonna help you play classical music better. Baroque music is actually highly syncopated. All these voicing ideas, phrase goals, we find in all styles of music. So just some key elements to remember, the rhythm. Swing those eighth notes, you can warm up on your scales. <laughs> Feel that stable pulse, but have some spontaneity to have some rubato to be flexible in your tempo. Be bold and dramatic on your articulations. Be precise on those. There's multiple accents. Make sure you vary that one of them is louder than the other for a natural phrase goal. You can decide in the left hand how you want to treat that, if you want to keep it all smooth, if you want to detach it, and to vary the piece throughout. Shaping, make it sound those, like those different jazz ensemble instruments, the saxophone with phrase goals, the trumpets more dramatic with those accents up higher. Try out some improv ideas so it sounds spontaneous. Have fun learning this jazz piece and some other ones in the future so you can transfer these skills to be better overall in your piano playing. Thanks, pianist.